Good afternoon. Um, just before I uh, introduce our speaker and welcome you all here, can you note that this talk is being filmed and live streamed, including the questions and answers? Uh, welcome to the Oxford Martin School. Thanks for joining us here this afternoon for a lecture by Dr. William Bird. Uh, this is a joint lecture between the Oxford Martin School and the Rockefeller Foundation Economic Council on Planetary Health, which is a mouthful. Uh, for those who don't know us, the Economic Council on Planetary Health launched in 2017. Uh, it's based here at the Oxford Martin School. It's tasked with making the economic and policy case for planetary health, and with communicating the links between human health and the natural systems on which they depend. Our report will be published next year, so keep an eye on our website, planetaryhealth.org ox.ac.uk or our Twitter feed, Ox Planet Health, for more details. Um, more importantly to note, the lecture will be followed by a drinks reception uh, next door in the cafe, so please do join us afterwards. Um, after the talk, we'll be having a 20-minute questions and answers session, so if you want to leave your questions to the end, that would be fantastic. Uh, to introduce our speaker... Uh, Dr. William Bird, we're glad to have you here today. Uh, MBE, he's the CEO and founder of Intelligent Health. Uh, he's a practicing doctor who started to get his patients more active by setting up the first health walk scheme in 1996. This led to him creating the Green Gym a year later, as he realised that companionship and contact with nature were major driving forces in keeping people active and healthy. He also helped to set up a health forecasting unit at the Met Office, where he's a clinical director for five years, providing forecasts to help keep health professionals predict and plan for weather-related illnesses. He's an advisor to the World Health Organization, Public Health England and Sport England. He set up Intelligent Health eight years ago. And with that company, he's created the innovative Beat the Street, a physical activity intervention program adopted by cities all over the UK. Beat the Street has had more than 950,000 participants to date and has helped to create sustained behaviour change, making healthier and more active communities, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this later. Today, William is going to talk to us about why we need a fourth revolution in healthcare. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sarah, and, and it is a, a real pleasure to be here, and, and it's great to have the interdisciplinary of where you have everyone in a very different kind of sphere. When I worked at Natural England, I remember being next to the dormouse specialist. So everything you need to know about dormice was in the man sitting next to me, um, and he knew everything about dormice. And I just thought, here am I as a doctor sitting next to the dormouse specialist, and that's brilliant, because I'm sure something eventually will connect. We never did, but there was, it was one of those things. And it started because I was brought up um, with my father being a doctor, and when I first started, in life, I was actually born above the surgery, and my mother was a naturalist, and we used to have stuffed birds in the fridge. So it was a household where medicine and nature were connected all the way through, and I've probably carried on ever since. So really what I want to talk about, um, and I'm borrowing from great people here who have um, been thinking about this, but in my way I've been trying to do the practical side of thinking about how do we actually deliver health care to be sustainable for the future. And let's start with a revolution. So the first revolution of public health was very much the one we know from the 19th century. It started with clean water, the sewage being sorted out, housing being sorted out, and air quality first starting to be addressed, and workplaces were starting to become healthier. So huge um, advances in health from that public health. And that's continued all the way through. But, however, we still have some of the worst housing in Europe, um, the dampest housing, the coldest housing, so still some way to go. So great, revolution one. Revolution two, modern medicine. So that's the medicine I've been deliver delivering as a GP for many years. Antibiotics, surgery, physiotherapy, um, all the things that we are completely used to of the diagnostics. And again, massive inroads. We're, we're treating cancers that we never thought could be treated. Hodgkin's lymphoma is now almost 100% curable, whereas before it used to be almost 100% fatal. HIV now is almost completely curable, uh, or at least contained. And modern medicine has done an incredible amount of good. So great on that. We're entering and kind of started 
the third revolution, which is that of personal health, where we're now actually more in control of our health with internet of actual knowledge, wearables that tell us a huge amount about our steps and about our heart rate and about our fitness and all sorts of apps and other things that we can actually do. And then you can have your genomes checked to find out what your genetic makeup is. So you know exactly that that ACE inhibitor is going to be right for you, but not right for the person next door. So we start to do this precision medicine. Precision medicine is where with your genomics, we know what would be best for that person with those genes or with that lifestyle or with that behavior change. And actually let's just remember that precision medicine isn't just genomics and, and, and um, drugs. It is actually about understanding someone's behavior. So you target messages directly to that person. Great. So that's it. We're sorted. But we can look forward to more disease because what's happening is as our life expectancy increases, you can see on the right, um, you've got men and women, and on the right-hand side, it gains in years of multi-morbidity. So over five years for men and, and about five years for women. But life expectancy is only going to go up to three and a half years or three years. So you've got those extra two years on average of disease, of living with multi-morbidity, of two, three, four, or even five long-term conditions. And that's going to get worse as we go into the next 20 years. So although modern medicine is great at saving our lives, the things like Alzheimer's, the things like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, where there's damage to the heart with heart failure, we're not actually managing to completely cure it we're holding it, and we're holding it very well. People don't die, but they don't get completely cured as well. So this is one factor. We've got long-term conditions, and we've got also, with all of this, we've got antibiotic resistance that's going to be developing. Long-term conditions will continue. So another 4 million people will be having arthritis in 2035. Another 1.6 million people will have diabetes in 2035 compared to what we've got now. So as life expectancy goes up, we're obviously going to get the more diseases which are an aging. So we're living now with more long-term conditions and with people with more disability. So you can say, is that a success? Is that something which is good? What about health inequalities? Are we doing well on that? Well, we're not. So the gap between those who are healthy um, and for life expectancy of males and life expectancy of females has remained remarkably stubborn all the way through. And billions and billions have been spent on trying to narrow that gap of health inequalities. And as you can see here, up to 2016, we're not doing a very good job. We're indoors. We're disconnected from nature. We're starting to get disconnected from each other, creating isolation and loneliness. And with all that heat coming out there, we've got some global warming as we actually look in our own houses. Inactivity because of cars means you get more pollution and you get more carbon use and global warming again. The urban heat islands, as we have less vegetation to be able to deal with urban heat, Lack of trees, and therefore lack of trees, it all fits with global warming again. So we can see here that there are certain conditions and there are certain aspects of both human health and global health that go hand in hand. And inflammatory diet, deforestation, and again, global warming. So we know quite clearly that a sustainable lifestyle, a lifestyle where we actually having an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, and we'll talk about that in a minute, actually fits in perfectly with the prevention of global warming. And we can see here, of course, we don't need any introduction to the global warming side there. So we're left, despite these three great revolutions, we're left with long-term conditions that are here to stay and will get more and more prevalent as we get long, oh, live longer. We've got health inequalities that hasn't budged. 
and we've got global warming. And not one of those three revolutions, unfortunately, save the public health, if we can get that right, is able to, has man managed to budge this. In fact, some people feel that actual personalised healthcare is going to widen health inequalities because those in the know who've got more knowledge, who've got more ability to make a difference, will actually find they're going to be better at using that personalised health and so health inequalities will get better. So let's go back to find out where it's all gone wrong. Let's find out how we can address those three big problems that we've got. So if we go back to being a hunter-gatherer, about 100,000, 200,000 years, I'll probably get all sorts of anthropologists here who will tell me exactly how far we go back, but it's probably about 100 or 200, and we put 1,000 years um, for one hour, so that's about 100 hours, so that's about four days. And you can see here that we were hunter-gatherers, and everything in our existence was a brilliant hunter-gatherer. And, you know, nothing really much changed until we came to about 10 hours ago. And that's when agriculture came. So we were still outdoors. We were still very good as a outdoors, but we weren't wandering around anymore as hunter-gatherers. We were still in those groups. But all of that time, we have been getting better and better and better as being a hunter-gatherer. Four hours ago, civilizations in Mesopotamia and in Egypt. And then big changes for nine minutes. So nine minutes ago was the Industrial Revolution. So that's when the car came along. So if you talk to your grandpa or your great-grandfather, you could still probably say that in the 1950s and 1960s, they were still active. They were still outdoors. They were still roaming around the streets. So despite this inactivity creeping in, there was still a lot of activity in the 50s and 60s as the Industrial Revolution had well developed and the cars were very much there. So when did the change come? Well, it's actually a few seconds ago. So just 80 seconds ago, it was technology and the indoor culture. So I've got a wonderful story of the family in Sheffield. And Ed, who is eight years old, and his great-grandfather both live in the same area still and have always done for four generations. The great-grandfather in 1919 was able to wander six miles with his friends, go out in the morning, come back when it's dark. That's it. That's all the instruction for these eight-year-olds going out, wandering six miles. Can you imagine now letting your eight-year-old go out and just saying, come back when it's dark? But that was it, what it was like in 1919. In the 1950s, when Ed's grandfather was out, he could go about a mile, but in that mile there were woods, there was, there was a valley, there was an old mine they used to go to, and again, it was go out in the 50s, come back when it's dark. Then Ed's mother in the 70s, well, she could go to the swimming pool, which was half a mile away, but come back in an hour, come back in two hours, because I want to know where you are. So we just started to get that feeling that things weren't right. Ed, he can't go out. So he is locked. He can go out with a parent, but no way, eight years old, is he going to be allowed out of the house. So something's happened. Something fairly catastrophic has happened in society for us to have this fear and this anxiety that we cannot let our children. And we can say all sorts of things. Traffic was obviously completely different then. Um, Newspapers were different about what, and the news and the internet and everything else was that. But basically, now, human beings are locked mostly indoors for a lot of the time. But if we look at our factory settings of what we should be like as a hunter-gatherer, well, it's very simple. It's three things. People, we should be all connected together. Place, we're connected to nature. We're connected to a supportive environment, an envir environment that's vibrant. And we have purpose, we've got value. We get up in the morning and we know what we should be doing and who we are and why we're here. That's pretty much it. And if you do the five ways to well-being or understand those, they're put on the bottom of connecting to each other, taking notice of things around you, and then being active, giving, and keep learning. That's our factory settings. That's where we should be. This is where we're beginning to go in this last 80 seconds. Loneliness. So we know that loneliness is the equivalent 
for cardiovascular disease is smoking 20 cigarettes a day. So loneliness is a highly stressful thing. It's not isolation, because some people love to be isolated, would actually think of nothing better than to go out and be completely on your own. So loneliness is a perception that you're feeling excluded. So you can be lonely in a workplace, you can be lonely in a family, you can be lonely in a school. The hostile environments we've created. Parts of Oxford are absolutely wonderful to walk around. Parts of Oxford are not good to walk around. And some places are absolutely intimidating. And that disconnection to nature. And then that lack of control, lack of purpose in our lives. And because that's so far away from where we've been, that creates a fear and chronic stress. Because our bodies were designed for this, and instead we've got this. So the human mismatch hypothesis that um, Lee had um, started to think about and is now obviously, for many of you will know about it, is basically say this is our ideal environment in this circle. But unfortunately, our new environment has shifted, which means you've got an area of mismatch, an area our bodies are not designed for, but an area where people feel insecure, where all our cells and everything that we've done in our life doesn't feel it's quite connected together. So this fear, chronic stress, loneliness, that then leads on to changes in our lifestyle. So first of all, inactivity. Um, well, we'd actually do this, let's do this one first, the diet and obesity. So when you're chronically stressed, and we're talking about chronic stress here, acute stress does a very different thing, and that's quite normal. You actually stop eating and you lose weight. You take up all your carbohydrate to cope with this situation. But when you're chronically stressed, you release ghrelin, which comes from the stomach, and it goes up to the brain, and it goes up to receptors all around the body, and it's designed to cope with your chronic stress because things are bad. You don't know when the next meal's coming. You don't know if it's going to be a famine. You don't know if there's a war. Something in the body is saying there's stress, therefore there must be a problem. So the ghrelin comes up, and cortisol, of course, and that increases your calorie intake. And that increases particularly in mice, but also they have done in humans, carbohydrate preferring to fat. So you actually crave for carbohydrate. And actually, as you take sucrose and carbohydrate and sugars, the anxiety is allayed. So you get this wonderful feedback that when you're stressed, the ghrelin is making you want to eat more carbohydrate and put on more calories, and you get rewarded in your dopamine for actually having it. So no wonder this comfort eating gets so good when you're stressed. You can feel how you're needing to have this carbohydrate. But of course, there's no point in having all that carbohydrate if it's all going to be expended and disappear. You've got to store it. So where do you store it? You store it in a place that doesn't get in the way of running and doesn't get in the way of throwing a spear. Your abdomen. So that's where visceral fat. So visceral fat is a storage of the extra load of calories that you've taken because ghrelin is saying store as much energy as you possibly can and we don't know what's going to happen next. And visceral fat's very different from subcutaneous fat. Actually, we don't care about subcutaneous fat. It's actually not very harmful. But visceral fat in your stomach, that is harmful. The cells just get bigger. Because it's only a temporary measure, in subcutaneous fat, you get more fat cells. In visceral fat, they just get bigger. So you get lots of bigger, bigger, bigger cells of um, adipose tissue. And those adipose cells get too big so they don't get enough nutrients and oxygen in the middle, and therefore they create an inflammatory reaction because they become hypoxic. And as you get these large cells, you start to get unsustainable. And their visceral fat is an incredible source of inflammation. So it's not a great thing to have. It's only meant to be there temporarily. When you become stressed, you also become inactive. Again, possibly because you're just trying to conserve energy, but your motivation drops and you find you can't go to the gym, you can't do the runs, you can't even go for the walks anymore. When you're chronically stressed, physical inactivity in, in, is encouraged. So we've got this chronic stress that's come in and fear, releases stress hormones, also smoking, drinking alcohol. Why is that? Because your inhibitory fibers are diminished. 
and your inhibitory fibers, obviously, if you're about to be, have a, a lion jump at you, you don't get out your spreadsheet and talk about a cost-benefit analysis of which way you're going to go. You jump whichever way you're going to go, or you leap. So your brain takes away the inhibitory, which means that smoking, drinking, alcohol can start to become much more of an issue when you're under stress. So you think of places where there's chronic stress, it's not surprising that we've got these behavior changes. And then that leads on to something else, because the immune system gets in the, in the game now. So you think, if you're going to be in a famine, or you're going to be in a war, or you're going to be attacked by animals, you've got to make sure your immune system is raised up. So chronic inflammation is one of the consequences of the chronic stress, and that's going to be a big thing I want to talk about. So chronic inflammation is when the immune system rises above its baseline and starts purring away. Think of your computer when it's trying to do some background stuff, a viral check or whatever it is. You type, you type something into the computer, nothing changes because it's doing some background. When your immune system is raised up, it takes all the energy from every other part of the body. It's king. The immune system takes more energy from anything else. It takes it away from the brain. So the brain actually is unable to do complicated things and think differently. So when you've got this chronic inflammation, your brain starts to diminish. You get tired. You can't concentrate so much. But the big thing about chronic inflammation is, unfortunately, it is the source of all of those diseases or a supportive of those diseases, if not the cause. Cardiovascular disease was probably the first one. Cardiovascular disease is an entirely an inflammatory condition. You've got your little fatty streaks on the artery, and they create inflammation, macrophages, parts of the immune system start to come to it. Increasingly, you get more and more inflammation until eventually it ruptures and all the thrombogenic stuff comes out and you get a clot. So all through the immune, all through the cardiovascular system, you've got inflammation. And if you measured your CRP, it would be raised. It's an inflammatory disease. And now we start to look at diabetes as an inflammatory disease and cancers as inflammatory diseases. Even anxiety and depression are now thought to be inflammation of the brain. You create inflammation of the brain and anxiety will come through. Arthritis, of course, is inflammatory. So our bodies, when our immune system is purring away and going up and up, seem to respond in a very particularly bad way. Originally, it was to help us to survive. But unfortunately, that's no longer. So we have a new problem, problems, chronic stress and inflammation. And these are the conditions you find in the more deprived communities. So it's not surprising that health inequalities hasn't shifted if we don't get to the root problem of dealing with chronic stress and chronic inflammation. CSI, okay? So that's how you can remember chronic stress, chronic inflammation. So we've got three conditions here. Long-term conditions, health inequalities, global warming, which haven't been sorted out. We now know about um, the, the reason of some of it. So let's have a look at the fourth revolution. Well, call it total health. You can call it one health. We can call it planetary health. We can call it a way which identifies where you have the person, the individual health, but instead of being in modern medicine where that is isolated, that has to be totally connected to health of a place where they live and totally connected to the health of the community. And the three come together as one. And it's slightly more than public health, which is behavior change, although obviously green space is now. So it is part of um, public health. It's a little bit of social prescribing. It's lots of things. But what we have to do is make sure those three central parts are connected together. Hippocrates, of course, as always, gets, always, gets all the glory um, because he felt environmental causes and natural treatments of diseases and the need for harmony between the individual and the social and the natural environment. How about that? Absolutely spot on. And we've kind of forgotten about the nature. We've kind of forgotten about the, the natural environment around us. We've even probably forgotten about the community aspect of health, as I've been sitting in my GP practice, doling out antibiotics when needed. 
have to assure you I do that only when they're needed, but also things, thinking about the person, thinking about their social setup. But I wouldn't be thinking so much about the parks around, but now I do. And this is where we have to, to go. So let's have a look at the person. Oh, I forgot to mention my sponsor, Fitterick. So if you can look at all of those, um, major effect on the faulty immune system, reducing pro-inflammatory markers, increases antioxidants, reduces the oxidative stress from Krebs cycle. That means it's, it's extraordinary in, in the fact that each mitochondria gets stronger. Um, prolongs the life of cells by stimulating telomerase, so the telomeres get longer, which we'll talk about. Reduces blood pressure, visceral fat, obesity, fibrinogen. I've got about 15 tablets to do that, and this is just one tablet. And, of course, st stimulation of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which helps to prevent dementia and Parkinson's. So there we go. If you want shares in it, it's free. That's Fitrix. Going for a walk. Going for a walk sounds really dull. It sounds really naff. And when I tell a patient to go for a walk, they can say, my granny could tell me that. You're meant to be a qualified doctor. Give me those tablets, send me to the hospital, and I want to see the top specialist. I don't want us to be told to go for a walk. Okay, well, let's have a look, see what a walk can do. Major faulty immune system, do da da da. That is what a data sheet of a dream drug would be. And we, gosh, we'd get really excited by that. We would be so excited if one drug did all of those things. Um, it would just sort out the world. And yet, because it's wrapped up in a walk, it's kind of lost interest. And yet, the outcome is identical to about 15 polypharmacy drugs that an older person would be taking to get that exact result. Anyone tell me why that's four times strength, that particular walk that's going on there? What else is going on? Sunshine. Sunshine, yes, thank you. So how many times were we told to wrap up completely and not ever go in the sun? And now suddenly we get rickets and we think, oh, actually vitamin D is quite important. So yes, we don't want to get burnt and we don't want to get um, cancers, but sunshine is important. Social. Social. Two people. Loneliness, similar to 20 cigarettes a day for cardiovascular disease. Companionship, we are designed to be, well, it depends who the companion, of course, is. <laughs> there are some companions you might not want to go with, but companionship is important. And the last one is green space. Green space. Yeah. So I can promote a book, the Oxford Textbook of Nature and Public Health, only £42, um, which we mean helping to edit. So it brings all the evidence about green space, which is extraordinary now, about how it improves and impacts the brain and health. So here we have four times the strength of a drug of the dream, and it's a walk. That's all it is. Now that is where health should be. That's how we should be doing it. Let's have a look a little bit more about the walking and the inflammatory, how it helps the inflammation. We know that inflammation is the cause of many of these chronic diseases. Let's go back to this bit. That's not actually visceral fat. That's visceral fat. The stuff inside, the white you can see inside, the halo around the outside is subcutaneous fat. You may not like that subcutaneous fat. Actually, I don't mind it too much, but I really, really mind you having that visceral fat in the middle. And what's so unfair about this one is that between the two, um, the top and the bottom, one's got 4.3 litres of visceral fat, and the other one's got 0.5 litres of visceral fat, and they've got the same waist circumference. How unfair is that? Waist circumference is a good proxy measure of visceral fat, but as you can see here, it's not perfect at all. And I've explained why visceral fat is so, um, such a problem, because of the inflammatory response it gives. Bring back the Fitterix. Fitterix sorts out visceral fat just like that. You can see the orange there is the amount of visceral fat is reduced just by walking for 13 weeks. The subcutaneous fat is the dark blue. And the more you have in diabetes, the more the visceral fat, which is one of the big components of diabetes, it disappears. So you can imagine a patient, oh, these patients didn't lose any weight either. So we did all that walking, and for the study, they ate a little bit more in order to not lose weight, but still their visceral fat plummeted. So they are much healthier now. Are they going to tell me that? No way. They're going to come back and say, Doc, that 
walking is an absolute nonsense. Look, I still can't get my jeans on. I still can't get myself together. I'm still weighing exactly the same as I did. It's nonsense. I'm going to go for diet, this physical activity. And I said, well, look inside you. Look inside you. All that visceral fat's disappeared. Well, we haven't got a CT scanner in the surgery, so we can't do that. But that's where physical activity specifically can attack that part. Let's have a look at the other things it can do. Just get walking, contract your muscles, and you get myokines. Myokines are interleukins, and they get an anti-inflammatory bath in every part of your organ for a few hours after every exercise you do. So it calms down the immune system just as it's meant to do, because obviously when you're exercising, everything's good and um, all fine and dandy. And then let's get back into the nitty-gritty of the cells. So here's a cell. I'm sure you've heard of the mitochondria. Anyone know where the mitochondria came from? Bacteria. Yep, thank you very much. About a billion years ago, as life was working itself out, the little bacteria fused with another bacteria, and life began, the eukaryote life began, and we've kept those mitochondria, those little bacteria, ever since. And they don't only power everything that we have, but they also power trees and slugs and snails. We're not actually very special people. We just use exactly the same batteries as pretty much the whole of life. So let's have a look inside that mitochondria. You've got antioxidants, you've got its own DNA, and you've got this ox oxidative phosphorylation. Here's a sedentary, high calorie, probably high rather than high fat, and stress. So this is a bad place to be. Battery charge is up. Every battery has to charge up. Okay, so your batteries are all charged up now because you've been sitting. Okay. You're not moving very much. So what is about to happen in your bodies, in billions and billions of little cells, is you're going to start to leak out free radicals. Because of all that heavy lunch you had, that bit of a stress you've got, because cortisol makes it worse, and you're not moving around, means you start getting free radicals because it can't hold that charge anymore. The inner and outer membrane of the mitochondria is absolutely at full capacity and it just can't hold it. So just like overcharging your mobile phone, it gets warm, the battery gets warm, that's electrons leaking out, also known as free radicals in the human body. So these free, free radicals are leaking out, not because we're energised moving around, because we're sitting down doing nothing and the antioxidants aren't able to cope because they haven't been stimulated enough. So, get moving, start to walk around, start to being active, perhaps have less calories on board, and reduce stress. And now the mitochondria purrs away. A professor of mitochondrial health at Cambridge, he says it's like a dynamo. It just needs to be moving all the time. You've got to keep your mitochondria going the whole time. And then... Free radicals fade away because the pressure, the, dis the um, potential difference has reduced. Antioxidants lift up. More mitochondria come through, cleans out all the debris in the cell. The cell becomes much he healthier. But let's have a look and see where those free radicals ended up. Because they didn't just stay in the mitochondria. Those free radicals, or oxidative stress ones, come out and they hit the chromosome, they get into the nucleus. So what's all this telomere business? OK, well, the telomeres were discovered, or the purpose of them, Elizabeth Blackwell at the University of California, for which she got the Nobel Prize. And she got the Nobel Prize because people knew at the end of every chromosome there was a repetitive genomic structure, which meant nothing. And it didn't program any genes or proteins at all. It was just sitting there. And nobody quite knew what it was. And then she realised that actually if those telomeres at the end, as she called them, were longer, then people did better. They had less disease and they were healthier. And actually following some of the people through, they got less diseases. And it's like a cap, like a shoelace at the end of a, um, a little plastic bit at the end of a shoelace to stop that chromosome unravelling, but also stopping chromosomes joining together. But its big thing is that every time that cell divides, the telomere gets a bit shorter until it gets so short that cell can no longer divide. And when that cell can no longer divide, it doesn't get replaced. 
And when that cell doesn't get replaced, you're one cell short, which could be a bit of your brain, a bit of your muscle, a bit of your bone, all shrinking. And that tipping point is 28 years old. So everyone past 28, I'm afraid, you're sliding down. I've been sliding down for a long time. And, but if you've got very long telomeres, that 28-year-old actually can be longer. And if you've got very short telomeres, it gets shorter. And what we know now, when we think about the fourth revolution of healthcare, is not only is the physical activity actually helping protect us from those free radicals, but if you're a child and has had a very up difficult upbringing, the adverse child events, then your, your telomeres will start off short before you've even started your adult life. So the chances of living in a very deprived area, having had a very difficult childhood, with lots of perhaps abuse or nutritional problems or stress as a child, the chance of you living longer is going to be very small because those telomeres are already short. So we've got this whole life course to actually think about. But there's only one thing that releases something called tamellarase. And tamellarase can make those telomeres go longer again. And that's physical activity. I can assure you there are lots of laboratories in the world trying to work out how do we make tamellarase. Because you can imagine, if you took tamellarase and it hit those telomeres and made them grow longer, hey presto, you've got the elixir of life. They're nowhere near nowhere near it's probably a bit more complicated but walking that simple thing we just talked about can do that that cell when it can't divide anymore goes into senescence sends out massive explosion like a supernova of um, inflammatory markers so that the immune system can destroy it and apoptosis it disappears so every time cells get to the end of their life, they're creating more and more inflammation, which is why as you get older and older, inflammatory markers go up a little bit. Okay, let's have a look then and see what our settings are for health, for green space. So we said it's people, place, and purpose. The place bit, here's some pictures of a pretty horrible outlook in, I think this is in South Korea. But these students were divided into four groups and one lot saw these pictures and loads of others. Another lot of students saw a bit of CGI thrown in some trees, exactly the same pictures as above, but with trees and green space and flowers and other things on it. Another group had exactly the same at the bottom, but the, green sp the trees were just a little bit microsecond released, subliminal. So they weren't aware in their cortex that it was happening, but subliminally, they had the trees released. And the fourth group had the trees explained to them by someone sitting next to them as they were looking at them on the screen. So all of these were done on screens. They did some complicated backward digital dubri thingy, I can't remember, but you have to subtract 13 from a big number and keep subtracting 13 until you make a mistake. Probably the most stressful thing you could possibly imagine. And then they did the experiment, and then they did exactly the same experiment on those four groups. So what happened? How's our brain wired? Does it really make a difference if you look at a screen with those? Or should we have to be outside in nature? And should nature make any difference at all? Well, the first one, those who looked at grey urban landscapes with no green at all, they did worse. <coughs> And every study that's been done has shown exactly the same thing, that after we've been looking at green or uh, grey infrastructure with no water and no trees, we actually get stressed, and therefore our brain gets less effective. The two who looked at trees, both subliminally and in real, both did exactly the same, which indicates that this is deep in our brain, this is deep in our limbic system, this is our reptilian brain, um, where a lot of this is happening. And then the other group had someone next to them, of course, did very well, because we like to have that social, we like to learn, we like to feel there was something about it. So if fat is so good and it can start to reduce the stress and depression, 
then surely the inequalities will get better because it will reach those people who are most needy. So if you can look here, this study done quite a long time ago by Popham and, um, and Rich Mitchell. Um, so you can see here, the lowest income is the dark blue, the middle income is the middle one, and the highest income is the light blue. On the left is the ratio of death. Okay, so death, the higher um, that is, the more death is happening. So the first thing you can see is if you look at each of those segments, the inequalities is horrendous. Those in the very poor areas are dying much at a much greater rate than those who are affluent. But as you go across the green spectrum, with a little hiccup at the beginning bit, towards the end where there's a very green environment around them, that gap has really shrunk. And that's because the green space and the greenery and nature is a way of making our brains feel comforted. It feels that we're not under pressure anymore. There's no famine to being. We can see trees, therefore there must be life, there must be water, there must be shade, there must be animals, there must be food. So the more we see water, biodiversity, a friendliness, not too, um, you know, not too thick undergrowth, we actually start to feel better in our brain. And you can see here that the gap between the rich and the poor is diminished hugely. What an incredible thing to be able to do just by being able to change the landscape of a city. So we've mentioned about loneliness. And I think we can probably all experience that part of stress where you've got sleep disturbance, engage in less physical activity, increased pain, depression, fatigue, poor health. These are all the things that happen when you're stressed or when you're lonely. And inflammation count goes up. Inflammation count also goes up and telomeres get shorter in carers. And carers who are looking after patients of Alzheimer's, a, a, a spouse of Alzheimer's, or a child of severe autism have some of the highest stress levels that we can measure. They've got equivalent of soldiers coming back from Afghanistan. And um, when a patient, when a spouse dies, uh, after three months, all their inflammatory markers go down again. So we've got this stress built into society in all sorts of ways, the loneliness, the carers, those who feel left out, those who feel in a you know, difficult relationships, a whole aspect, and children in particular. So let's have a look and just see what we've got in the people. So we've got this people purpose place, chronic stress and poor health behaviours, mitochondrial damage, telomere shortening, chronic inflammation, and that creates our long-term conditions. That's my world. But actually, it's more than that. Because if you look at this chronic stress and inactivity, poor concentration... Tiredness, irritability, addiction, depression, weakness, chronic inflammation are all consequences of this mismatch. And as for society, you get less people outdoors, therefore the streets become less safe because there's less vigilance, poor air quality because people are in their cars, reduced learning at school because children do worse if they're stressed or if they've got um, no inactive, if they're inactive. Productivity at work goes down because people are inactive or eating the wrong things, and therefore the brain is being devoured of, of energy. Um, dependence of elderly, because people haven't been active their lives, therefore they are more prone to falls, sarcopenia, and other things. Less volunteering, because there are less people outdoors, less people connected to each other. Isolation, obesity. This activity, this walking, this very simple thing, starts to completely, if it's not there, destroy a society. An inactive community is a dying community. It can't function as it should be. There's no interaction. There's no interaction with the place. There's no interaction with people. Get it right, and everything unwinds. Everything spirals upwards and feeds on itself. Because the more people are out in the park, the more people want to go in the park because it feels safe. The more people are talking to each other, the more people want to go out to talk to each other because it becomes the norm. It becomes a cultural norm. So our focus in health has kind of gone from let's build tennis courts, swimming pools, and football pitches. 
That's how I used to when I was in the 1990s. That's what I was told as a doctor. That's how you get patients active. And I saw my di diabetic patients. They said, I hate sport. I hate swimming pools. I can't bear the gym. I said, well, it's tough then, isn't it? You can't do anything. And then, of course, I went for a walk with my dog. And I went past all the houses, because there's a GP, you, you know, everyone, where they all live. And there wasn't a single patient out walking on a lovely July evening. And I thought, hang on a sec. You tell me you can't do all these kind of fancy things like gym and go swimming and all of that, but you can go for a walk. And actually, that's how the health walk started, because we realized the men, the men were worried they wouldn't be able to get back because they wouldn't be able to climb over a stile, because it's a bit rural. And they were worried about getting lost. And the women are worried about fear of being alone. So hence, we got the walking groups together. But this is how we were meant to be. And this was the exercise referral, decommissioned by NICE because it had no evidence. But after 12 weeks, it made the jot of difference to your physical activity. So now it's been asked not to, con to commission it. It can work in a few isolated places where they've got it right. Then we went to the community base. So this is the park runs, the health walks, the green gyms, the salsa classes, all of those things which we can see in a community. Thriving, brilliant, fantastic. Got people all in groups. And that's where we started to democratize physical activity. And that's what we're doing now, which is social prescribing. So social prescribing is where people can actually lead a walk or go for a salsa or do art therapy or do dance or do whatever it is to be able to get people engaged. But we're not going to do our fourth revolution like that. That's still where we are now. The fourth revolution actually relies on the entire community taking ownership. Everyone becomes a fitness instructor. The doctor for his patients, the teacher for, his, for their pupils, the shopkeeper for their customers, the workplace manager for their employees, the receptionist. Everybody starts to take control of the health and those around us and we start to share it together. And that's a social movement. So that is the social movement where we start to own the problem of health. And that's where walking and all these other things, connection to nature, arts, and all of those things start to help to narrow the gap between the health inequalities, to help with climate change, because we know that obviously is going to be everything we do there is going to be helpful for that. And long-term conditions can be allayed. We shouldn't have diabetes. We shouldn't have it existing. A few people might be able to get it, but if everyone was active, and if everyone ate a very normal, reasonable diet, we wouldn't have diabetes, not near we have it now. It is a disease that could almost be obliterated. Just imagine having no diabetes in a community because everyone's taken on the health themselves, working with each other and using what's around them as medicine. The Fitterix medicine they're taking. So let's have a look and just see how it can work, how you can motivate it. This is the green gym. So that's conservation work. Here's a lady who's been doing the green gym. And she went to aerobics as well. And we monitored her heart. And we looked at her and said, OK, you've been doing step aerobics. What did you do? Well, 20, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we did the warm-ups and everything like that. And then we did real hard workout and got my abs sorted out, my pecs and everything like that. And I got my heart rate up to here. And I was feeling out of breath. And my re breathing rate went to this. And it was really exciting. And then we did the calm down. And we did 20 minutes really hard work. I said, brilliant. That's fantastic. All about herself and her body. Notice, OK? But she had a good time. She loved it. She went and she had some people. She then went to the green gym. <clears throat> and you can see there, there's a tool talk, tell you how to work out an axe and a bow saw at the beginning. And then the heart rate goes up. But if you notice, that heart rate goes up more than 20 minutes, more than an hour. In fact, it went on for two and a half hours in the cardiovascular training zone. So she was doing conservation work for two and a half solid hours at a training level. So we asked her what she did. Oh, she said it was amazing. I went down and we just looked at the bank of the river. And apparently there are water voles coming back. So if we clear some of that 
litter and that other stuff there and clear the back bank and be able to take some of the mooring ropes away, we'll be able to get them back again. And then we learned how to get the butterflies back for this area here. And I learned what all the trees were. And I realized there's an otter, which is up there. I had no idea about that. Met some fantastic people. We had a big cake and we went down and had a cup of tea. But, but you did two and a half hours cardiovascular training and you haven't mentioned that at all. Why, why should she mention it? Why do we have to do health as an extra thing? Health should be as part of normal things. Health is a means to an end. The end is fulfillment and happiness. Health should never be the target end. It shouldn't be the end itself. It should always be the means to an end. Physical activity is definitely a means to an end. Because that lady has done more for her health, but she hasn't realized it for health by stealth, if you want to call it that way. And <clears throat> um, Sarah mentioned about Beat Street we've been doing, where we've now got over a million people who, from the most deprived communities who've taken part. And we make it a game. That left thing is a little RFID beatbox. And we put those all around a city or town. And we give every single child in that area, with all the schools, a little RFID fob. They take it home and give it to their parents, their aunts, their uncles, their neighbors. Then the workplaces get them. And before we know it, we have up to anything between 10 and 25% of the entire population playing a game, which they think, how am I doing this game? This is great fun. And as they go out, they're meeting each other, they're talking to other people, they're exploring areas. We can bonus points so that people can go to the parks and green spaces. And for six weeks, the world is transformed in that place. So Barnsley, 37,000 people were playing. In Hounslow, we've just finished there, 26,000 people playing. And we know that all sorts of things have taken place. But the most important thing is the most deprived communities are the ones that benefit the most. Because it's not health. We don't mention health. Public health pay us. But actually, for them, it's about a game and opportunity for the future of going to the parks they've just discovered and learning new things. And here in Hounslow, Hounslow traffic people put a camera up for Beat the Street to find out what happened before and after Beat the Street for six weeks. And you can see the gradual decline of, how, of cars and vans as more people want to walk to school because that becomes the norm, because everyone's trying to get more points for their school in gaming. It's a game. Now at the bottom, we've seen even after a year that you sustain that behavior because now the mum or dad has actually had quality time with their child and it's worked very well. So what started off as prizes becomes looking at the environment, meeting up with friends, feeling good about yourself. The prizes were there just to get it going. Let's put those away now. So let's have a quick recap of this fourth revolution. We've got resilience down the left-hand side of strong social networks, that place, feeling secure, connection to neighborhood, purpose. If that's weak, then the stressful events create chronic stress. And chronic stress has that horrible effect on poor diet, inactivity, alcohol, drugs. Stress hormones then come out, visceral fat forms. We haven't talked about the microbials. Then you've got that triad of disaster, of chronic inflammation, telomere shortening, mitochondrial damage, leading in to all the health problems that we know in society, which will continue even if we've got the best medicine, because as people live longer, we're going to have three or four of them, and we'll have more and more and more people with diabetes. Improve that resilience. Strong social networks, beautiful place, connecting people together, giving people that sense of purpose and control over their own health and their life. Strong resilience, stressful events are now battered off. And if we could do that, we'd get the satisfaction, happiness, and healthy diet. So thank you very much. I'll leave that with you. But the fourth revolution is where human beings in communities, in groups, just like when we were in our origins of a hunter-gatherer, take control of our health. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was fantastic and a lot, a lot of food for thought there. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, we've got a microphone, so if you want to put your hand up, we'll wave at you and then bring the microphone over and shout into that. Who's going next? 
Thank you very much. That was really amazing to see how well you could express something that we all kind of know, but not that well expressed. Um, if I understood you way, right, you, you, one of the main things you use is gamification in order to spread this. How do you spread this by itself from community to community without having somebody like you have to be there and instill it? How do you make this so it spreads like a virus across the world? Uh, <clears throat> that's a great question. And I think we've used Beat the Street as an experimental to really learn what it is that drives people and makes their life change. So from that, I wouldn't expect you to have Beat the Street in every place on, on the planet um, so that we can try and get people to do it. But I think the example of the Green Gym is you go to where people are in their, what they believe in, what their values are, and trying to understand that. And what we found for most people doing Beat the Street is that they want to do something for their children. They don't care about themselves. They want to do something for their children. They want to do something for their community. And they want to keep learning and understanding things. And by making something very local, ultra local, so there's no bus ride, they can do something there and then, whether it's learning some craft or doing the conservation work or going for a short walk um, on a lead walk, that is enough to get them out of their cycle of being indoors the whole time. And the thing that will get them going will be something which is not health, which is not physical activity, which is not 150 minutes, it's not 10,000 steps, but it's something because my grandchild told me to do it because I want to go back to the old place I used to um, work. I want to go into the football stadium where I support. So you're trying to make those things back to normal. So health gets lost. And what we've lost is that we put health at the centre stage. And if we put health at the centre stage, we'll always have to, the um, health inequalities. But instead, what do people want? How do they want their communities to work? Beat the street, we've learned a lot that people want something very simple. They want a nice place to live. They want it to be comfortable. They want it to be good for their children. They want to be able to have green space around. Um, and they want to be able to walk without fear of cars. If we can try and get those values into people, then I think we can actually spread the, the understanding without it having to be a game. Hello, um, fantastic talk, really enjoyed it. And uh, like the other gentleman said, to tell us a lot of interesting facts and things. One thing I was interested in is your, your particular graph that demonstrated that as green space increased around where people lived, whether they were medium income or low income, their health increased. But I personally don't know of many places that are very green or pretty high green where low income families are even able to live because by the time somewhere becomes very green, it prices low-income families out. Just That's the way our society works. If you look at inner-city London, I can't think of a single area that is classed as low-income that looks green. The moment it becomes green, it gentrifies, yeah, yeah. And, and those people can't live there anymore. So apart from gamification, which sounds fantastic, and there have been you know, attempts at it before, you know, um, how, do we, how do we address that problem? So... On this, oh, it's gone now. <laughs> I'll put it on here. Um, on this study, they did, a, they did um, make sure that there was that accountability, but it was actually, um, it wasn't just where the gentrification comes in that, that it actually goes up. So they allowed for that. Interesting, when they did this in the States, it didn't show that relationship because in the States, um, where you had um, green space, actually, it meant you were in a suburban area and everyone was in the car. So there was no physical activity whatsoever. So there was zero physical activity. So that actually was a much, much flatter line. Um, I think this, there's just been a new study that's been done um, of, uh, of this and many other studies. It was done, I think, in the Lancet, um, if I'm right, last year, um, where they actually took all the studies together to work out. And they did show that if you do plant up or you have what's perceived to be a safer area of green space, it does reduce um, inequalities, it does help many things on the, on the health front. So it's just by 
increasing the greenery in a way that people understand it. So you don't want to have shade of people or people hiding behind hedges and things like that. Um, by intervening, it does make a difference. So I think there is a, there's a part of understanding what greenery counts, what it is. And obviously, there are a lot of studies and people who've been working on that. But there does seem to be that you can make it as an intervention. And you don't need to gentrify it just by having the greenery, because this can be in big housing estates where you can actually increase the greenery. Um, Incredible Edible, who've been doing a vegetable um, work all around um, Todcaster, etc. Um, they've shown that you can actually improve a housing estate with greenery and keep the people there and keep those benefits. So I think it's understanding what part of greenery it is, what value it is, what the dose is, how it's planned, how it's marked. I think we're still quite a long way away from knowing exactly what the prescription is, in a way, to a place where people live to make that better. But I do believe, from what we've seen and the evidence, and I could get that study up, but it is some value we can do that. Hello, thank you. Um, I was wondering what the sort of evaluation showed from using these plant gardens or these green gyms um, to increase dietary, uh, you know, productive dietary outcomes and dietary changes over the long term after they had partaken in these activities, and if there were sort of measurable circumstances that you saw through using that method that led people to actually choose better options in reality. Um, no, we haven't done any, any of that research. So two things about the diet, and it's slightly out of my area because um, the dietary side is not my, my strong point. Physical activity is much more. But I do know that when you are active and reduced, when you're stressed and inactive um, and obese, the ghrelin and the hormones that change make you choose the wrong foods. You tend to go for the high calories and the and refined carbohydrates. Um, and that, that is well known. So just by taking people's stress away, you can start to actually undo that and they can choose a slightly better diet. We've never done any studies on a green gym. We've done physical activity and we've done their stress levels, but we actually haven't chosen that we haven't done anything about their dietary behavior. I'd love to think that it changes, but we haven't got any evidence. Um, but certainly choice of food is the thing that seems to change a lot when, um, when, when physical activity starts and stress comes down. I'm afraid I can't answer that question. It's not been done, as far as I know. Right the back there. Hi. Um, so my question, and it, it has just been touched on a bit, is we know that, um, so you talk about people, place, and purpose essential to inflammation in the body, but we do know that the food that you eat is also essential to that. So I also wondered... I know you've sort of just answered it, but within that, we know that across the UK, there are food deserts, nutrition deserts, where people can't access fresh, healthy food that would help with the inflammation in their body. So I just wondered what your thoughts were around addressing that. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't go into the, um, the food side of it because it would have taken it too long, and it's also, as I say, not my strongest point there. Um, you saw on, the, um, on this one here... Um, is the unhealthy gut microbia. Um, and obviously we now know that the gut-brain axis and how the microbes, 45% of our cells in our body belong to bacteria, um, as we know from the gut. So it is a hugely important side. And what we eat makes a vast difference, but also how that gut bacteria is laid down really from in utero and when, we have, when we're born. So even... If you're having a caesarean section, your gut microbiome would be different than if you had a normal vaginal delivery. So we should be going right back there for dietary changes of understanding. Antibiotics under the age of six months probably has major, bigger effects than we've ever thought. Um, so the dietary side is, in a way, starts before we've even e eaten anything there because of getting that gut bacteria right. Um, because you become better resilient when you've got the gut bacteria all healthy. But you're absolutely right. There's a, a real problem with nutrition. And I think to have the holiday hunger programs across Britain is absolutely disgraceful. I just find it the most horrific thing that people don't have enough money to be able to have a normal good diet for their children during the holidays. And we have to have these 
um, holiday hunger programs, otherwise it will just be refined carbohydrate and that's all they'd be eating. So it is important. Growing, I think there's always have to be a perception, there's this whole thing about growing your own food. I would be very surprised that people would be able to continue with that in some of the very deprived areas. We just have to ensure that good food is much easier to get. But actually, getting people's choice and making sure that they don't have to crave for the refined carbohydrates is probably as important as well. Uh, gentleman in the red jacket in the middle. Thank you. Um, can we go virtual? Uh, and is that going to be relevant? In other words, should my screensaver be a tree? <laughs> should it come on every 10 minutes? And should I have a tree picture on my on my office wall. Obviously, it doesn't have to be trees all the time, but I'm just wondering whether virtual actually could be a difference and whether that could be a way of scaling up really dramatically. Yeah, well, I, I hate to say this, um, but the evidence shows it's very, very effective. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to... <laughs> yeah. And, um, and I know a lot of the exciting work going on for older people who are doing virtual walks with um, VR, virtual reality, um, and the little um, thing, they don't have to get their feet off the ground, they just can shuffle backwards and forwards, and they can do walks with friends, and they can go to places they used to go as a child, and it's all done in virtual reality from their sitting room. So if they can't go out, so I, you know, there's one part of you says, well, that's dreadful because they should be out, but if they can't get out, great, because they're getting some activity and they're reliving an experience they used to have. But having green pictures in operating theatres makes a difference in recovery. Having your screensaver makes, Microsoft have obviously done it well with the screensavers they've got there. Um, yeah, all the virtual stuff, it does work, but the real stuff is better. <laughs> Chris? I've got a microphone, so I'll speak. Um, <laughs> part of the deprivation that you were talking about a few moments ago, holiday hunger, food banks, and all the rest of it, is a political choice that's been made in this country over the past 10 years or so. So uh, how are you taking your program to government, both national government and local government? Because there's a lot of persuading to do there. I mean, we've been um, <laughs> sponsored by Sport England, and some of the CCGs, Sport England, have got a very high target of reaching the most deprived communities and getting them more active. <clears throat> and they're really struggling. They're really struggling to get sport and physical activity and get the people in the very deprived communities to be able to take, take part. Um, luckily, the chief exec is now banning the words hard to reach um, because it's our problem, not their problem. And I think we have to realize that the way we've been doing things in the past has been quite patronizing and, and wrong. When we come into a place, we get them, for all the schools on board, we get a huge amount of ownership. What we're struggling to do is to get the government and the NHS particularly to show that actually it, this can be done. Um, you can actually, you know, there's, it's quite ability, there's quite an ability to get people engaged in healthy living and healthy activities, but we can't do it in the way we used to do it, um, which is probably more of a, a top-down and little schemes, this has got to be come from the community upwards, the community owning it, the community enjoying it, not mentioning health, not mentioning some of the things, but just to get people to, to just bring out their own ingenuity and understanding and doing things with their children and doing things in their local area um, so we can start to, to build it up. We go away and we know that there's some sustainability that lasts for over a year because we've gone there. But we're trying to get the dietary side into it. We're trying to get some of the other fines. We find public health sometimes just not quite getting it. Um, I can understand that, but I think in some areas of public health is still struggling to know how to deal with it. And I, I, think we're, I think we're still struggling to do it. But you're right, politically it has been a problem, but there's still a lot of people who don't, I don't think, understand that this is, a pos this is possible and you can make it happen, but you have to invest in these places to make the infrastructure better and get people to own the problem themselves and build it up. I'm not sure that's a very good answer because I'm not a great politician on that, but uh, I don't know if that helps a bit. Do you want to just feed back on anything there? That's fine. <laughs> uh, next 
Lady halfway back. Um, my question was going to be similar. It was actually, what is the role for Public Health England from a policy perspective? But linked to that, um, obviously, Public Health England and its policies trickle down to the GP surgery. Is there not a critical role for GP surgeries and the practice of GPs and the surgery environment somehow in actually generating this process? I think there's massive change. I mean, I think GPs' roles are going to have to change dramatically if we're going to make any headway at all. They're going to have to become, or we are going to have to become public health consultants as well and take the role of the surgery in our, in our vicinity and make that area an area which we have to look after, not just the people in it, but actually have an infrastructure change around it. PPGs, um, the patient groups, are now beginning to get a bit more teeth and some of them are starting to really understand how they can look after that area. And GPs starting to say, no, you can't, you've got to build a crossing there. You've got to, you can't build on that green space over there. So I think GPs are going to be vital for taking part. But of course, we're not trained. Um, but I do think at the moment that public health sits over there, GPs sit over here, and we still haven't got that connection. And I think it's way overdue that we get that right. And I think we're going to have to. We're going to be forced to, because otherwise we're unsustainable in our job. Hi. Um, of course, the last few people have sort of taken the questions we're going to ask. <laughs> um, the last one was on the politics. I mean, we've got an election coming up, and uh, politicians are out money into the National Health Service. So they even invent that they're going to build lots of hospitals and all this sort of stuff. So my spin on all this is, how do you deal with all the vested interests that are vested in doing it differently from this? And also, can you have a little bit of exploration about the stress thing? I mean, there are so lots and lots of things driving stress in modern living, whether it's people stuck on computers all day, the, or it could be their jobs or their contracts. Which kind of policies would you enact to sort of make modern living less stressful, <laughs> as it were? I have vested interest <clears throat> in the health system, in the TV, you know, and lots of places that are trying to drive us away from, you know, healthier living, basically. It's interesting. We've been doing some work in a, a big bank, um, a very successful bank. It's money orientated, and you've got all the commercial managers, and they're starting to talk about kindness in the office. They're starting to talk about values and sympathy and understanding people where they're coming from and trying to make a place which is actually going to be much kinder but for them to do tough work really tough work where the pressure is still there but they feel secure and the you know these these top managers were talking about the girl who comes every more every monday morning and she talks and talks and talks about the television the night before and over the weekend and what happened everyone says oh my god she's on again and everyone was kind of you know eye rolling and then they realized that she never saw anyone the whole weekend she had no friends and no family and as a manager of an office where you're trying to get the best out of people you're starting to see a shift they're putting plants in there. They're doing bird song in some of these um, managing back. I mean, these are things you'd never have heard of five years ago, 10 years ago. So I think we're starting to see the corporate sector beginning to take this and saying, look, stress is destroying our bottom line. How can we make people perform and be happier at work? So I think there's a, a line. I don't think you can actually impose it. Um, I think, but. I work in the NHS, there's an awful lot of catching up to do from the NHS. It's a very stressful environment and, and I think we're, we've got a long way to go on that. Um, and then I think it's the infrastructure. I think the biggest thing we can do is to make places a better place to live. Um, that will be a vast amount of infrastructure change, a lot of money needed to do that. But a little bit how Liverpool was transformed when Hesseltine went up there and made something there. I think every housing estate and everywhere where there's real danger, where air quality is awful, where the roads are right by schools, we've just got to change it bit by bit with a 30-year plan to change our infrastructure where most people who are struggling with stress live. And I think that's probably the, the easiest way we can act, well, not easiest, but the clearest way we can make a difference. And then I think the workplace is the other. I think we're, we're uh, out of time for questions. Obviously, we'll be going next door for uh, drinks reception. So if you've got more questions, feel free to talk to William there. Um, if you've enjoyed this talk, uh, please keep an eye on the Oxford Martin School website. We've got talks from Paul Nurse and Chris Whitty being announced uh, imminently. And all that remains is for me to thank William for an excellent talk and lots to think about. <laughs>